my name's Lydia Nicholas, and uh, I am an anthropologist who likes to look at information. Uh, and particularly, I like looking at information as it goes on interesting journeys. Uh, information that starts in a messy Petri dish like this, and then travels, changes form to move into a scanner. From there, it moves into a database. From there, the excited scribbles a scientist makes in the margins. Then a peer-reviewed paper. From there, a commercial deal, manufacturing deals, regulate, regulators, prescriptions, and then you get a pill packet that helps you deal with, with whatever uh, health problem is messing up your day. I'm particularly interested in talking to you today about the places on those journeys where information can get stuck, where some kinds of information are just too complicated, uh, too expensive to produce, too strange, too hard to work with, uh, that they're experiencing prejudice, and so those don't manage to make it through the entire system. Uh, because those kind of decisions are the sort of things that mean that we end up reproducing yesterday's blindnesses and biases in uh, the things that we're trying to make for tomorrow. All of the little personal decisions that we make that have a lot of cultural bias attached to them end up, over time, accreting into building information systems. Uh, things like the entire academic uh, system, uh, the research industry, a lot of markets, that kind of thing. Um, and all of these then create more incentives to produce more information in the forms that work for them. We're in real danger of reproducing biases a lot of the time. Uh, as a simple example, this is a multiple choice quiz. Uh, it's the sort of thing that a lot of kids have to take in school. Now, the information that comes out of that sort of exam is incredibly easy to move up, uh, to, to average across a class, to average across a school, a region, between cities, across countries. You can do analysis on it to check progression. You can turn it into nice charts and league tables. But we know that it doesn't capture all of the information that we want to know about education. It doesn't capture everything that a child's poem does, that a project where they learn to delegate, to share, to negotiate. So we know that we're missing that information, but because the system relies on these kind of graphs and analyses, these league tables, that pressures teachers and kids to change their behavior, to produce the kinds of data that the system understands as real and that have real consequences for their lives. We have a huge opportunity right now, as we stand at the dawn of the information age, to take a look at ourselves and at the systems that we're building. We're only at the very beginning of the massive uh, exponential curve going up about the, kind, the amount of information that's being collected about us and about our world. And we're rapidly creating systems to help us cope with that deluge of information, to make better decisions based on all these things we're learning. And if those decisions are encoded, in computer systems, in bureaucracy, they often end up looking neutral while they're actually hiding a lot of really important and useful information about the world. Uh, so I tried to investigate this more in a synthetic biology project. Uh, synthetic biology is an interesting discipline which is about cutting things up, uh, getting genes out of them that do useful things, and plugging them together to make useful uh, and saleable products, usually. Uh, so you take the gene for glowing pink from a jellyfish, you take the gene that uh, can detect a pathogen from a bacteria. You take them out, you plug them together, put them into something else that's alive, and boom, hopefully, if it works, you've got a dressing, a bandage that glows pink when a wound is infected. That's the hope. Uh, so I was working for two years with a team uh, who were made up of biologists and bioinformaticians, uh, lots of people on that side, and also computer scientists and complex systems uh, modelers, because they were trying to create a new living organism, but also trying to create a computer model uh, that would be able to predict certain bits of the experiment, and so speed up the process in the future. And what's interesting there is that, of course, at the end of a computer science academic project and a computer science biology project, you end up with the same thing. You end up with a peer-reviewed paper that's accepted by most people as more or less true. But actually, before that, there's a lot of mess. There's a lot of difference. And so there end up being a lot of arguments, arguments about the practical stuff of science, as, uh, like your calendar or how, you, how often you're going to meet, as much as the scientific stuff of where the cutoff point should be, where the errors are. And why is that? Well, in fact, it's 
uh, the computer scientists would say is because the information that they produce is much easier for the, the academic system to use. It's much uh, easier to replicate across different machines. It's much easier for different people to pick up and reuse without making all of the complicated lab equipment and picking up the physical skills of working with that strain of bacteria. There's a lot less context to it. It moves easier through the system, up and down scales between projects and so on. Whereas for the, for the poor biologists, they start a, lot, a long way further from the clean and certain looking numbers. They're working with these living things. They're, they're trying to coax them to do what they want. It's, it's kind of like trying to convince your house plant, your cactus to flower, really desperately hoping. Uh, they're often staying overnight. They're often trying to inject just the right amount of diluted solution at just the right time, fighting the other grad students for the giant laser and hoping that someone else hasn't messed up your settings. Uh, it's an incredibly complex task. And you don't always know why it's gone wrong if it goes wrong. Uh, one told me a story of how his experiment had been working fine for months, and then suddenly, boom, stopped. No idea why. It turned out after a few weeks of investigation, expensive, tiring weeks, that uh, someone higher up had changed the manufacturer of the agar, of the stuff that the bacteria eat. It's supposed to be exactly the same, but those bacteria were sulking. They did not want to perform well in the experiment. And he never really understood why. It was just something that happened. It's just something that you have to learn to live with. And this means that when the, the biologists and the computer scientists meet, there are arguments uh, that come down to really core things about what our picture of truth should be. The computer scientists, uh, and I've been a web developer, I, I understand how they feel, they want the latest information all the time so that they can check their models, so that they can iterate it better and make sure that their model is matching the experimental data as much as possible. But for the biologists, three out of the six repetitions of an experiment isn't 50% of the way to true. It isn't really anything. They can't from that tell you, if I do this, then this will happen. One plus one doesn't always equal two. There's a lot of mess. There's a lot of confusion. Uh, and that means that a lot of the, uh, the scientists will quite openly talk about there being a hierarchy of uh, sciences. Uh, this is a complex system modeler. Uh, he would quite happily tell you that he would see physics up here, then chemistry, and then, uh, and he made the noise in the interview, uh, biology down here. Um, why? Because two of those sciences, the ones that don't have that messy, wet context, they're very easy to replicate, to simulate, to program. The biologists, they give you stories. They're fuzzy. There's a lot more going on that's connecting them to their context. Now, there's the bit here where um, a scientist then turned to me, a, a biologist, and as I was trying to work out about this hierarchy of forms, and he said to me, you do realize that none of this is real, don't you? Of course, that's the kind of thing that perks up your anthropologist ears. You do realize none of this is real, don't you? He's like, yes, the E. coli that we're working with has responded to the pressures of the lab environment. The sort of things that we're trying to make, these replicable stories, these things that happen over and over again, we've pressured the E. coli to become like that. The E. coli in the lab don't evolve as fast as E. coli do in the wild. They've learned to be easy to work with in order that we give them a really nice, cozy home. They don't actually have a lot of the vibrancy, uh, the evolutionary power that those that are in the wild do. Uh, because life uh, in microbial life, I suppose all life, is messy, it's interconnected, it involves a lot of randomness. Sometimes the bacteria that you're working with will decide to hibernate. Uh, there's not much you can do about that. One in a thousand will just do it. Uh, sometimes they'll misread a signal and act just weird. And other times they'll replicate a bit of DNA wrong, they'll just make a mistake and something goes wrong. Now that's really annoying, but that right there is evolution. That's why we're trying to learn from life in the first place. That's its most robust, extraordinary and powerful feature. But the information system that we, the information production system that we've developed squeezes that out of the very things that we're trying to study. And why is that a problem? I mean, because we want results and we want them fast. We want new cures. We want new treatments. Well, unfortunately, that information system can produce results that are not fit for purpose. Uh, so uh, there was a story in 2006 in a hospital not far from here uh, 
they were trying to test a drug that was developed for leukemia. And it had been tested on mice, on rabbits, on monkeys, uh, hundreds of times, and they'd suffered no adverse effects. This was a really great, there was great hope that this could give people with destroyed immune systems through uh, leukemia a, real, uh, a new shot. So they tried it out on these six volunteers. And within minutes, every single one of them suffered catastrophic and systemic organ failure. They had to be rushed to intensive care. Uh, some of them stayed there for months. They lost their fingers and toes. Uh, some were developing cancer within weeks. Their immune systems were destroyed, and they'll never fully recover. Well, why? Of course, people ask, why? Um, and there's a lot of debate, and eventually, the answer comes down to this. Uh, don't worry, I've got an explanation. Um, <laughs> the, the animals in the, uh, in the labs had been kept in sterile cages, in clean white boxes that look as much like a spreadsheet cell as possible to ease the translation of data from their bodies into the databases that could be analyzed and produce information. But the humans, their immune systems had developed in a messy, context-filled, complicated world. They'd learned from every childhood sniffle, every stomach bug, every interaction with the people around them. And so they were primed to react to this drug in a completely different way. Uh, this is the problem. We're creating these animals that produce replicable results, but they don't necessarily match our bodies. We could do it in field mice, but unfortunately, that would take forever. Uh, it seems like a really huge problem. Uh, how do we create a system that provides us with what we want, but at the same time doesn't miss so much of the complexity of the real world? Uh, fortunately, I'm not the only one asking the question. Uh, Nature produced an entire issue about the reproducibility problem in October this year. Uh, it went into a lot of depth about the issues of the pressures being put on scientists to produce clean, clear-looking data, uh, and to produce stories that look very convincing but when people try to reproduce them, they can't. They don't quite find that the story is as convincing as the first time. The thing is, no one needs to lie. The system itself is putting pressure on everyone all the time in every little decision about how to clean data, how to tweak your inputs, how to fix your algorithm, and in the end, produce a story that your PhD supervisor, your funders, your colleagues will respect. So Nature looked at this case study, which is where um, they had 29 different teams attack the same data set with the same question to prove that, in fact, no one needs to do anything wrong for you to get very, very different, much more complicated answers than you expect. Uh, These are 29 different teams who uh, looked at a data set in order to answer uh, whether darker-skinned football players received more red cards than their lighter-skinned teammates. So it's a very, it's a complicated topic that touches on a lot of issues of prejudice and bias, but you would think that these scientists weren't prejudiced that way. All they wanted to do was to tell a compelling story. You choose just one of those results, and you put that in a newspaper headline, and you've got something that seems to prove something important. Either there is a lot of bias there, or there isn't. And either of those could, be, could sound dramatic if spun the right way. Uh, the thing is that nature wants to answer this by having more crowdsourced experiments, uh, more times when there are teams that are all working on the same problem. Uh, but I think that we can do better than that. Uh, I think that we need change, not just at the individual project level, but in culture, uh, in our institutions. We need to learn to respect uh, an honest picture of confusion uh, and sometimes uncertainty over dishonest clarity, over dishonest confidence. We need to learn, if we want to step into a future that isn't narrowed down and blinded by the prejudices of the past, to learn to create systems that respect our fluctuations, uh, that respect the, um, the strangeness and the wonderfulness of life itself. Thank you.